So this is the critical approaches lesson, and it's essentially the same as Dr. Poole's lecture, just in um, a different format. Uh, but the plan is essentially the same. So uh, I'll introduce and give you some background on critical approaches and then cover sort of one of the cornerstones of critical approaches, which is the method of critical analysis. So as we get started, uh, we'll, we'll need some background on the father of the critical approach, uh, Karl Marx. So this is sort of just the context that you need to understand the major points, uh, not necessarily anything that you'll be tested on, but the most important things for you to sort of take notes on are listed in the bullet points for the slides. So we'll start with a question. Uh, was Karl Marx wrong? Uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union and a bunch of other communist nations, uh, it's often said in the media or various intellectual circles that the fall of those communist nations proves Marx's analysis was wrong. So we're going to investigate that a little bit. Um, Marx is one of the most famous philosophers of the 19th century. Uh, his work on both philosophy and economics have been super influential. Um, and what Marx essentially argued is that as you look through history, you see a natural progression through various forms of economic development. Um, we start out with slaveholding societies in Rome and in Greece. And in those cases, the economic power uh, was provided by slaves. After that, we come to the feudal area, era where we have lords and peasants, uh, the peasants work for the lords. And also in that feudal era, we have independent artisans that form guilds, like the Potter's Guild, for example. And those artisans owned the means of what they produced and they passed it down through generations. So it's likely if you're a potter, it's because your father was a potter and his father was also a potter. Um, succeeding that was the capitalist system. So capital, uh, large amounts of resources, have to be invested to do things like build factories and produce goods and pay the workers that make those goods and work within the factories. So Marx is around uh, during the 19th century, and he saw this emergence of factories in Germany and particularly in England. Um, he kind of saw that the move from the farm to the factory was not always a super happy one. Um, workers were kind of packed into row houses. Uh, the organizations didn't treat them all that well. And if you remember our lesson from uh, about classical organizations, the classical organization evolved in part to give workers some degree of rights and safety uh, so that it wouldn't just be an all out war between the factory owners and the workers. So Marx believed that while on the surface, it might look like the factory owners and the workers have you know, pretty common interests, in actuality, they have inherently very different interests. So he tried to theorize that difference in arguing that as we went through each of these periods, there was a revolution in which the means of production were changed. So from slave labor, labor to farms and small workshops and guilds to factories, the ownership of production changes too. So back in the feudalist system, for example, the potters that we talked about, they own the wheels that they make their pottery on. They own the means by which to produce those goods that they sold. So this is really different from the capitalist era. Um, Marx points out that in the capitalist era, the workers don't own the means of production. The workers don't own the factories like the potters owned their wheels. And what Marx argues is that this puts the owners of the factories in inevitable conflict with the workers. Uh, the owners get richer and richer. The workers get poorer and poorer. Uh, he says that the workers will then realize that they have 
common interests. Uh, they'll band together. There will be a revolution and we'll move on to that next system, which he said was socialism. Then, of course, communism was the political system that sort of grew out of socialism. But uh, the several states that adopted communism, not all of them fared all that well. So Marx was wrong in a way. He was wrong about how history would unfold, right? So there really hasn't been a breakdown of the capitalist system. Uh, capitalism has proven to be really adaptable. Uh, China has capitalism and still maintains a communist government. Vietnam has an authoritarian capitalist state. And uh, in various European countries, there's capitalism in which the workers are partial owners of the organizations. They have members on the board of directors, for example. Uh, but then we have U.S. capitalism, where um, there are basically stockholders as owners and the workers just work for the organization. So even though uh, in the U.S. there's still some diversity like worker owned co-ops, for example, uh, capitalism has proven to be pretty flexible and it hasn't broken down. Uh, there hasn't been a revolution to usher in this uh, utopian socialist society. Um, and in fact, most of the so-called utopian socialist societies, um, like Russia, weren't a great place to live towards the end of communist rule. Um, when the world began to integrate, communist nations found that they were just not quite flexible enough to adapt. Uh, of course, there are still some communist nations, China, Vietnam, North Korea. Um, but by and large, Marx was wrong about how history would unfold. Uh, there may yet still be a revolution, but it looks like capitalism may continue to persist for quite a long time. So while Marx was wrong about predictions, he's still regarded as one of the most influential scholars because of the method of social analysis that he developed. So he developed a method of social analysis that really enabled him to draw conclusions um, and while the conclusions were wrong, partially because of limited data that he had at the time, his method of analysis is still used today, and it's been kind of built upon and added to and expanded upon. And in fact, he is still, uh, and his critical analysis is still the foundation of the critical approach. So as we develop this kind of second element of critical analysis, the analysis of power relations and organizations and society, we're going to do that kind of through an analysis of arguments that all together make up a story about how society is organized in a way that is different than it seems at the surface. Um, it is organized in a way that puts some people in a position of power over others. And it also does so in a way that kind of hides that it's doing that. So the first premises of critical analysis um, is that uh, power in organizations and societies are not quite what they seem. Uh, what they appear to be is hiding something underneath that's quite different. So we see society organized in a way with certain power relationships up to now, as we looked at organizations, we had, you know, the classical organization, human relations, human resources. Um, they're all organized to achieve certain goals. And the argument has been with all of those systems that we've looked at so far is that the organization is rationally put together to achieve uh, certain goals. If someone is in charge, it's because that person has proven to be effective. If someone else is a manager, the idea is that uh, the organization is there to help them kind of meet their goals. Those at the bottom of an organization are there because that's where they're best suited. So basically, the reason things are organized this way is to help the organization meet its purpose. But what the critical analyst says is that if we look deeper, this isn't always the case. 
Of course, there are goals that organizations have, but there are also other things going on in organizations, uh, in particular, power relations. Uh, most of these operate in a hidden fashion. At a deeper level, organizations and society exert control over people so that some people have an advantage over others. This kind of basic analysis that things aren't quite what they seem, that's really what lays at the, the core of the critical approach. So we're going to kind of explore some of the consequences of these means of control that seem to put some at an advantage at the expense of others. So a question that you might have after hearing that first argument is why the organization is con exerting control over people. Why are those necessarily disadvantages for people? Um, critical theorists say it's because they take agency away from people. That's why um, they are ripe for critique. So when we say an agent, what we mean is a person who uh, has the ability to make decisions about their own life without being kind of overly constrained. So an agent is ha someone who has the ability to exert control over their lives and all of critical analysis is based on this idea of the agent. Um, the basic notion is that to be an agent, you have to have control over the conditions of your life. And if you don't like where you are in your life, you have a way to get out of that situation, to not be forced to do what you don't want to do. Um, an agent also has some control kind of over uh, how they work or where they work. Um, and also they have control over how they're governed. So they might not love taking orders at work from their boss, but they realize that they're taking orders kind of with their consent, not because they're forced to. Uh, the notion of kind of actively wanting to participate depends on having control. And finally, the agent should have kind of variety in life and not spend every waking hour working two to three jobs just to survive. Uh, the ideal model of the agent is someone who is in control over themselves and their lives. Um, it doesn't mean you can do whatever you want, of course, but it means that you have a voice in determining the nature of the organization, of your work, and uh, of the authority that people or organizations have over you. So critical theory argues that the structure of society and organizations prevent people from achieving this ideal model of the agent. So that's kind of where we're going to take this in future arguments. Uh, we're going to go over why critical theorists argue that the structure of organizations prevents people from realizing this ideal model of agency. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, why are the structures of society set up in such a way that prevents people from realizing this full benefit of agency? Um, it really starts with the pervasiveness of power in society. What critical theorists argue is that different groups of people have different interests and those different interests come into conflict. One group attempts to control the other through power. Different groups have different sources of power. Uh, for exa example, management and workers have conflicting interests. So managers try to gain control of workers through formal power, for example. Uh, the workers may resist. They may band together. They may do some kind of protest, maybe form a union. Um, but the struggle over the arrangement, the power arrangement in an organization is decided by means other than like pure rationality, pure rational disposition. Um, Miller discusses uh, some sources of power and one of them is that formal authority like management has over workers. But there are a few more that 
we want to add. So one is control over technology as a source of power. If you know how to fix a computer or how to operate a machine and you're the only one who knows how to do that in an organization, that gives you a degree of control. The organization now depends on you and you can use that to your advantage. Uh, symbolism is another source of power. Well, when the CEO is walking around the office or when the president's walking around the factory floor, you see people following around, following them around and that makes them look powerful. Or think of um, like courtroom dramas that you watch when the judge comes up um, to the room or up to the bench. They, everyone has to stand up. It's the whole all rise thing, right? So uh, that makes them look powerful. That is symbolism as a source of power. Um, so one more that we're going to talk about is the control of decision agendas and processes. I should probably fix that, huh? There we go. Um, so the... Uh, control of agenda and decisions, if you can control what issues get talked about and how, especially how they get talked about, you have a, a certain amount of power. So by controlling the agenda, you also are controlling what is possible to be discussed. Um, power is involved in nearly all aspects of organizations. And remember, different people have access to different degrees of power in the access they have to power tends to give them leverage over other groups that allows them to put their interests over other groups, kind of imposing their interest on others. So as I mentioned, uh, power is used to control. So the basic, the basic argument for critical theorists is that some groups use their power to realize their interest and control members of other groups. For instance, um, if you look at most boards of directors and see who's on them, it's usually old white men, right? Uh, this is getting a little bit better, of course, but it's still largely the case and was certainly the case, uh, let's say, four or five decades ago. So because people that are older and white tend to be preferred for these positions, uh, they have their hands on levers of power and can kind of use those levers to realize their own interests and not take into account the interests of others. Um, as an example, we're going to look at uh, maternity and paternity leave or parental leave. So uh, for a long time, getting parental leave has been a struggle for workers because a lot of people in control of these organizations uh, are old white men. And even though they think they're being sympathetic to sort of the situation of the workers or these new parents, they might not understand the needs of others in the organization, the need for a mother to take time off to recover from giving birth and to spend time bonding with her child and uh, for that matter for the father to take time off and spend time um, getting to know his child. So inadvertently the group of old white men in the boardroom that resist this um, rather than seeing parental leave as like a benefit for the child or for the worker they see it as a disadvantage for the organization. Uh, that's an example of people in power kind of realizing their own interest through controlling members of other groups. And of course, this is not intentional. In most cases, the old white guys are just really convinced that they are making the rational decision. Uh, is it necessarily bad that one group prevails over another? Maybe those old white guys have points of view that help the company prosper and that uh, in turn help the workers and all the employees for that organization. Um, but by imposing their interests, what they're really doing is preventing other voices from being heard. And actually, most studies show that family leave does not hurt 
productivity of organizations. And in fact, it can help make workers feel better about the company, feel more loyal, and be more productive when they do come back because they're kind of refreshed and reinvigorated. So if the older white men kind of had more of a dialogue with these people and heard their points of view, they might realize that they could help uh, keep productivity and increase loyalty from those workers. Uh, the use of power is what keeps that dialogue from happening. And critical theorists say this is a problem. Uh, critical theorists say that if the interests of everyone can be realized as much as possible, the organization will be as a whole better off and the people as a whole will be better off. So uh, I gave that example of, you know, older white guys in the boardroom, but we're in the middle of a shift right now. So um, a few years ago for the first time, there were more lower level female managers and organizations than males. Uh, people of color are getting into higher levels of organizations, and this is because of the persistence of pushing for rights and pushing for inclusion. This is something that critical theorists say, hey, we can help with. Um, it will improve all organizations over the long run. Um, as these older men, like in the parental leave example, uh, who decided against leave, when they made that decision, it was a process that at the time seemed super rational to them. Uh, the company can't profit if we pay five weeks for someone who's not working. This sounds, you know, super rational. And in a way it is, but... It doesn't sound rational if you hear the other points of view. You can keep employees happy. They'll be more committed. They'll be more loyal to the organization. They'll come back refreshed and more productive. So critical theorists argue that it's this limited point of view um, is actually what makes their decision not rational. Because their decisions are made by a small subset of people that have not heard our, all of the arguments. They're not working with complete information and not all the points are considered. So this pretty much equates to making the decisions arbitrarily. So after listening to kind of that example, you might ask, um, why doesn't it make the new parent really angry? Um, sometimes people do feel that way but it's surprising how many people don't. So there was a study by uh, a scholar named Erica Kirby, and she found that a lot of new fathers don't even ask for paternity leave because they don't feel comfortable taking it or they feel a responsibility to the company. So why don't people raise an uproar? Critical analysts argue that it's because of ideology. So ideology is a system of beliefs and ways of thinking that we really take for granted. Uh, as the definition here says, ideology is a system of beliefs uh, that we buy into and presents things that uh, this idea that everything is rational, that there's no power imbalance at all. It's just in the best interest of the company and we all kind of go along with it. The white males might say, we literally can't afford to do this as an organization. It will cut into profits. We can't offer this benefit. Uh, the assumptions behind that are the managers have the good of everyone in mind. Right? That's what this is assuming. Second, uh, that the firm's goods depend on people working. And third, it doesn't raise the idea that these guys um, kind of having time off might reinvigorate those employees um, and there's and causing them to be more loyal. So the, the managers in the room making these decisions are not taking these things into account. They are assumptions that are being made. And that's uh, in a nutshell kind of what ideology is. There's an ideology that these guys in the boardroom making the decisions have wisdom about how to run the company and that's just the way that things are. So ideology is accepted as sort of common sense and if you buy into it, you accept the control essentially. So um, in another example of ideology, when we have a recession, we view it 
as a zero sum game, right? If the firm or the, the company doesn't make a profit, people have to be laid off. The assumption is that you are hired kind of on a short term contract, potentially, that if things don't go well, you're laid off. That's the way we tend to think about these things in the United States. We just see this as kind of the natural state of affairs, and most of us accept that. But in Europe, it does not work that way. Uh, in Europe, when there's a downturn in the economy and the company's not doing very well, uh, everyone in the company takes a cut in salary for a little while in order to keep people on the job, to not lay them off. Um, Hewlett Packard in the U.S. actually uh, didn't do what most U.S. firms did. When they were suffering during the recession, everyone took pay cuts, but especially the people at the top of the company. And that really ran counter to the common sense notion that when there's a downturn, you lay people off. Uh, they kind of said, what if instead the company owes their workers loyalty? They deserve to not be laid off. They deserve a living wage to have loyalty from the company. They're the ones who built this company and they deserve not to be laid off. So the ideology by kind of presenting the organization as just naturally this way it conceals the true state of affairs. That is that some groups are being advantaged at the expense of others. Um, it's also important to realize that ideology is a communications-based phenomenon. Ideology is maintained by the communication that we see every day, um, by the bosses in the company as being accepted as you know the ones in charge, the ones who know best. And even now on TV, the people in power are white males. And that's changing a little bit now. We have uh, sort of more diverse leads. But if you constantly see white males in authority, it reifies that authority. It reinforces it. Um, and the result ends up being that we have ideas that hide over the disadvantages that some people are placed in. The ideologies kind of serve to preserve existing power relations. So one more example of ideology is that in the U.S. we have this idea that anyone who works hard enough can get out of their situation. Everyone has an opportunity to advance and the implication is that we're all equal in our ability to advance. But um, it's a lot like a YouTube video that was really popular probably five, six years ago. Um, it's like a 100 yard dash with some people starting um, at the 20 yard line, some people starting at the 50 yard line, some people starting at the 80 yard line with only like 20 yards left to run. And we always say in the US, right, that we have equal opportunities. Um, but a lot of you probably in this class have been born into families that aspired to you getting an education. Uh, many of you went to good schools, you were encouraged to go to college, um, and there are millions of people who grow up with really lousy schools and college is not even on the radar. It's not even something that they think about. They have to work really hard to make ends meet. They have very little encouragement and no role models. And those people don't start out equally. And it kind of makes you realize that this cherished ideology that we have, that all people have an equal chance of success, is really not true according to decades of research. We do see people, of course, coming out of really tough situations who, like, against all odds, make it out of their bad schools or their bad neighborhoods. And we really hold those people up as examples, saying, see, they can succeed. But when you zoom out to the big picture, most of the people who succeed in life are the ones who didn't have to go against all those odds. So this is the ideology of equal opportunity. And that ideology of equal opportunity covers the fact that, uh, yeah, while it's still possible, uh, really a lot of people have a head start over others. So that's an example of ideology that critical theorists really frequently point out. So ideology presents uh, sectional interests. The interest of a particular group as if it is the interest of everyone. 
uh, so if we go back to parental leave as an example, by not including others in sort of making the decision and by deciding on their own, um, that board decides they're only going to listen to their own interests. They argue that their point of view kind of trumps everyone else's. And it's these sectional interests that are presented like they're in the interest of everyone. Um, the ideology is the thing that denies fundamental equalities in the system. And it is not at all clear that the person contributing to the ideological ideological argument does this, uh, it, you know, it's usually universal. Ideology makes the status quo seem really natural. So if an ideology is really effectively spread across all of society and it's continually reinforced and taken for granted, we have what Miller calls a process of hegemony going on. So uh, this term hegemony was uh, developed by an Italian sociologist, Gramsci, and he used it to refer to the process by which a dominant system of meaning is so widely accepted that the dominated groups, they accept subordination as the norm. Uh, so for instance, back to the example of people born with advantages, uh, because they live in a good neighborhood, they have good schools so they can advance, versus people who are in circumstances less conducive to advancing. Um, the dominant system is bel of belief is that you can advance if you work hard enough. The corollary to that belief is if you don't advance, if you don't become successful, it's because you didn't work hard enough or you didn't want it enough or you did something wrong. And these beliefs, if you just listen to the media, you hear this sort of thing all the time. Um, you know, how many stories are there of people who are born into terrible circumstances and then rise to become kind of the rich and the famous? Um, but this system is, of beliefs reinforces the idea that you just need to work hard enough. And again, it says that those who stay in the circumstances are just stuck there because they didn't want it. Um, Critical theorists argue that this becomes so accepted that people who are dominated tend to buy into the story themselves. They accept subordination as the norm. So the people that went to these bad schools and the bad neighborhoods, they just assume uh, because of this hegemony that that's just the way things are. Uh, this was the case in the 80s in regards to parental leave. So people bought into the notion that, you know, companies just can't afford it. They thought, yeah, all right, we're not even going to raise the issue. So hegemony is when they accept that common knowledge. Um, if you connect that with critical approaches, uh, you can see this in the poem that you'll read for your forum post this week uh, called Dominant and Dominated. And it really kind of dives into um, how a dominant person sees the dominated and vice versa, and then the various choices that the dominated person has. So that leads us into sort of the last two arguments. Um, the argument up to now is that things aren't what they seem. Things seem to be fair and rational, but to an extent, the organization system is a power system. Some groups hold power. They maintain that position through other groups being disadvantaged. Um, this ideology is reinforced by other people, by the media, by the organization, by society as a whole. And there's a trap here. One group's position is held for everyone. And the result here is a hegemony where the people who are disadvantaged come to accept the ideas that keep them down. So there are um, a couple important qualifications. Uh, the first is that there really aren't any big critical theorists who say this is all because of a grand conspiracy. Um, the critical theorists aren't saying there are, you know, a group of you know, world leaders in a room laughing evilly to make all of this happen. Um, what they argue instead is that uh, 
ideologies and the people in advantaged positions are just as captive to those ideologies. So people born into really good circumstances don't realize that that's maybe not the way it should be and that there are, are alternatives. Um, essentially all groups are trapped by these ideologies. Advantaged people feel, you know, enormous pressure to succeed. And if they don't, they're seen as failures to everyone. Um, so everyone is hurt by this, even people at the top. So critical theorists tell us that um, if we can just get people to see what's happening, we can free people from that trap. Um, the other qualifier is that there are alternatives. There are all kinds of sort of dissenting views expressed in society. Um, Miller calls this resistance. So there are a whole bunch of avenues for resistance. You can drop out. You can struggle against it. Uh, the reason we have parental leave now is because there were groups struggling against that accepted position. Uh, many feminists fought really hard for that. And in the 90s, the Clinton administration required parental leave, um, unpaid parental leave, but a step in the right direction. Uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement is another really interesting example that I lived through. So the Great Recession uh, in, was in 2008, and that's the year that I graduated from high school. Um, and a few years into that recession, when I was an undergrad in college, probably a sophomore or junior, I think, um, the Occupy Wall Street movement was really getting big. And the point of this movement was that they were resisting this idea that during a downturn in the economy, firms lay off low-level workers, if you remember that example from earlier. Um, they were resisting that really commonly accepted ideology that a CEO deserves to make 287 times more money than the lowest paid workers, or resisting the idea that the CEO is worth 287 times more, works 287 times harder than the low-level employee. Um, these movements or acts of resistance push back against society's ideologies. Um, they attempt to go against that cultural hegemony and say, no, I am not willing to be a part of this power imbalance anymore. And critical theorists point out that the dominant have the ear of the media, their ideas are repeated over and over. So the resistance is really fighting an uphill battle. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, I would recommend Noam Chomsky's idea of manufactured consent. Super interesting if you're interested in that sort of thing. So that brings us to ask kind of what is the role of the communication scholar in this or the role of um, a scholar in general? The role of the scholar is to begin to create the antithesis. So the thesis is sort of the status quo and this creates Resists, resist, <laughs> resentment, and this kind of gives rise to the antithesis, the critique of the status quo. So yes, we do need to have family leave, for example. Um, the communication scholar, according to critical theory, uh, their role is to see through the ideology and to really analyze the discourse. Remember, ideology is a discourse because ideology is communicatively created and sustained. So like Miller said, um, the role is to uncover the unheard voices. Um, the role of the communication scholar or the scholar in general is to uncover those voices and make people aware of those ideologies that a lot of times they just take for granted. Um, once people are aware of the ideologies, the argument is that you've made a really long step towards freeing them from it. Um, because once you begin to sort of get away from the status quo, that's when you're able to start to see alternatives. And this is the ultimate goal of a communication scholar from a critical perspective. Um, critical scholars argue that the role of a communication scholar is to emancipate people from these beliefs. So does that mean that uh, critical theorists want to see all the people in power, you know, knocked down a peg or, you know, brought down low? Um, I don't think that's what most 
critical theorists really want. What most argue is that the people in power are just as trapped by these sort of irrational uh, desires or these irrational interests as the people who are disadvantaged are. They're both equally kind of trapped by that irrationality. And the best way to make an organization rational is to rise or raise all the voices that have a stake, not necessarily just bring uh, the top toppling down. Um, we'll talk about kind of alternative ways of organizing in a little bit, but there are ways to incorporate workers into decisions. Uh, so critical theorists don't all want to destroy the status quo. They want to pretty much just level the playing field. And to do that, we have to break through some assumptions. So the goal isn't to destroy, but to let unheard voices be heard and to promote a more sort of democratic view of the firm and of the company. So we're going to talk about a few examples of critical approaches and critical analysis. And the first example is what's called uh, conservative control. So it's a phenomenon that will kind of define by working up to that definition of the term. So conservative control in organizations was developed by George Cheney and Phil Tompkins. And what they were trying to do is sort of trace our identification with organizations by enthymemes. So identifying means we see ourselves as being an important part of the organization and the organization is being an important part of us. We feel a sort of oneness with the organization. Um, and they argue that when we do this, we buy into the values of the organization and this allows the organization to influence our behavior and our beliefs via enthymemes. So um, if you are unfamiliar, an enthymeme is a syllogism with one or more unexpressed premise. So um, for example, all people are mortal, Socrates is a person, therefore Socrates is mortal. In a syllogism, kind of all the reasoning is spelled out. An enthymeme is a syllogism where someone makes a claim, but it leaves you know, one or more of those premises unexpressed. So for an example, um, if you really identify with your organization and you are at the end of a really long shift, you have two minutes until you get off work and you're off the clock and someone comes in at the last minute with a problem that is going to require you to stay uh, 15 or 20 minutes and you know that you're not getting paid for that time when you're off the clock, you know, your shift ends, you're not gonna get paid for the 15 minutes that you stay later. Um, the kind of reasoning process that these theorists say is going to unfold is this. Um, the company is always right, and unexpressed premise here is that pleasing the customer is good for the company. So this important customer has come in and wants you to do something that's a little bit unreasonable, stay 15, 20 minutes that you won't be paid for. But you accommodate the customer so that the organization can benefit. Um, you identify with the organization to such a point that you accommodate that sort of unreasonable request, uh, you know, working without being paid. And by staying to kind of help the customer, you do that because you identify with the organization and you incorporate their values into our premises. So to the extent that we identify and internalize the values, uh, the enthymematic process, we can often act inconsistently with our own interests. We act against our own interests. We're suppressing uh, our interests in favor for the organizations. So Cheney and Tompkins kind of extended this to study uh, the way in which conservative control, that's what this is called, um, that the organization controls you because you accept the values. So next we get to um, 
another example that comes from the study of team empowerment and organizations. So you might remember when we talked about the human resources theory or human resources type of organization, uh, one of the means by which the organization tries to develop its members is by involving them in teams. And these teams are sort of given the ability to self-manage to a certain degree. Um, and it's meant to empower the workers. So in this particular study, it's at a company called Excel, and it's a manufacturing company that was, you know, pretty hierarchical. But they went and they took a look at uh, some European companies that were really uh, very effective and took a team-based approach. So Excel came back, they reorganized this factory into three teams, the red team, the blue team, and the white team. Um, and they let those teams decide how to organize the workplace. And they let them organize themselves as long as they met their production quotas. Um, if they didn't meet those production quotas, the managers would kind of step in, uh, come help them problem solve and that sort of thing. So James Barker studied these self-managing teams. And what he found was that putting people in teams actually led to a stronger system of control. So in the blue team, there was one member who was consistently coming in a little late to work, you know, by 10 or 15 minutes because she didn't have childcare in the mornings and her daughter's school was really far away. Um, you know, she was, she was, running against the clock, uh, having to speed to get from school to work on time. And the other members of the teams who manage themselves began to talk about it and say, you know, she is not living up to her end of things. She's showing up 10, 15 minutes late pretty frequently. And what happened was that the team met without her and set some rules. They said, if you were late more than two times a week, you have to do extra work. You have to stay late after work for the amount of time that uh, you didn't show up at the beginning of your shift. And the woman was not aware that these changes had been made or that these decisions were made. So the next day, she comes in late and the weekly leader informs her and said, uh, you know, that this isn't fair. We've all made this decision. So, of course, uh, she was really upset, but the teams all stood around her kind of in a little like semicircle and said, sorry, this is the way that it's going to be. Uh, the woman tried to go along with the rule, but she eventually left the team and quit because she just couldn't live with this new rule. So, what we see happening here is as the team moved into self-management, it incorporated management's idea that they had to meet a quota and they organized all the work around that goal. They adopted management's goal as their own and they adopted rules that were pretty inflexible. Um, Barker, the scholar who was doing this research, concluded that Team-based systems uh, led workers to control each other because they internalized the organization's values and rules, and then they imposed those rules on each other. And on top of that, they were often less, less flexible than the traditional managers were. Um, you know, a manager maybe would have sat down with that woman and worked something out, but the team uh, was not willing to consider alternatives they had kind of a, a stronger discipline on their own members. So the moral of the story sort of here is that teams can internalize the value of people other than themselves to an extent that the values can control the team. So this is an example of hegemony in which they are controlled to an extent that they don't even question it and they go on to reinforce those values and reinforce those rules at the expense of others. So the second example um, expands one that Miller kind of discusses really briefly. And by expanding it, we can see kind of interesting ways that the ideologies may operate in organizations. So um, 
This is from a study called uh, Sequestering Sexual Harassment. And before we start, uh, it's probably helpful to define uh, sexual harassment. So sexual harassment in this study is defined as um, offensive conduct directed at a worker because of the worker's gender or gender orientation. Um, it can include pictures, speech, unwanted, verbal slash physical conduct of a sexual nature, end quote. Um, so this conduct is definitely actionable. It's against the law, but it's a real problem in uh, U.S. organizations. So um, a recent study found out that over 40% of women and 15% of men report being sexually harassed in the last 10 years. And um, the law is really on the side of the person who's a victim of this harassment. Um, they can sue, and if they have evidence, which granted might be hard to come by, um, but the, the law is on the side of the harassed. However, it's surprisingly rare for people to bring suits. Uh, that same study found that 60% of women said that they experienced unwanted sexual attention in the workplace, but 85% um, never filed a formal charge. And one reason is that sometimes it's hard for people to produce evidence so that it's not a he said, she said sort of thing. But there are other things going on here, too. So a scholar and researcher named uh, Robin Clare went out and studied these responses um, to a number that a number of women had to experiencing sexual harassment. So she interviewed them about um, the incident and how the organization responded and how they felt about it. And for the most, most part, she was framing her questions to get to kind of the objective recall rather than opinions, just trying to get them to reconstruct the situations. And what she found in her research was that to a surprising extent, both organizations and women kind of collaborated to frame harassment so that it just wasn't seen as a problem. Um, the responses represent uh, some interesting ideologies. So uh, the first to bring a sexual harassment suit is not in the best interests of the company. If the woman identifies with the organization, um, she is much more likely to choose um, what she thinks is in the organization's best interest, even if it goes against what is in her best interest. Um, the second is we would never let someone sexually harass you. You must have just misunderstood the situation or misread the situation. And once again, uh, this is, you know, expressed by the manager. And this is attempt to kind of deny or disguise the problem. Um, the ideologies, remember, attempt to sort of cover or paper over a problem. Uh, this is a really good example of that. Uh, this company is so good that we wouldn't let anyone do that. You misunderstood. So third, something else that was conveyed was boys will be boys. Uh, the dominant issue, the view of the men are naturalized and reified. Uh, men are just going to do this once in a while. And when Claire kind of explored with the women to see how they how they reacted to sexual harassment in the workplace. These are the responses that they gave. So they frame it kind of by colluding with the dominant view. Um, some women just accepted the dominant interest. One woman uh, in particular decided to quit rather than file a lawsuit. She just said, you know, it'll be easier. It'll be easier if I just leave. Um, that buys into something that's not in their best interest, right? She's sacrificing herself. Um, the other buys into that second organizational argument. She's buying into the premise that, you know, she's misunderstood. Um, and then the last one here on this slide buys into the boys will be boys ideology. Uh, these are women who have been harassed, sort of finding excuses. Um, and we can trace this to them buying into the dominant ideology of the organization and choosing um, what benefits the organization instead of 
their own interests. So um, other examples are, oh, it's trivial. It's not a big deal. Another response was a uh, denotative hesitancy. So she was acknowledging that, you know, this guy in the workplace made an advance that looked sexual, but she didn't really want to label it as such. Um, and then third here we have finally, you know, this is a private matter. I'll handle it. They take responsibility themselves in these situations instead of putting it on the company. So in effect, this is a, a really textbook example of the ways in which um, an ideology can make us accept certain behaviors. How we think the organization is acting in the best interest of the workers. And these beliefs advantage one group over another. It ends up in a collusion between the women and the organization to sustain these conditions that really kind of aren't that great. <laughs> um, so remember, ideologies are enacted. They control behavior of disadvantaged groups and they preserve uh, the privilege of advantaged. So these are a couple of, exa of examples that show kind of how a critical theorist would approach a topic and try to make power relations in an organization a little bit more relevant or evident. Um, so what they try to do, again, is make people aware of what is happening. Um, remember, critical theorists uh, say that people are agents. So if they are aware, they can try to change things. And many critical theorists would ask kind of what are the ideologies that you hold today that you take for granted, but that give you an advantage over other people? Or maybe what ideologies do you hold um, that you buy into that disadvantage you? So the critical theorists really try to look for alternative voices and perspectives and then surface them so that they're part of the dialogue that we are having both in society and in organizations. So in class on Tuesday, we'll look at some more examples and we'll start kind of discussing your opinions about the role of critical analysis in the organization. And again, see a little bit more about um, how we can perform critical analysis in organizations and what that can tell us about uh, the people that work there, how they interact, and how the organization functions. So with that, I'll let you all go and I will see you on Tuesday.